Bernie Sanders has rocketed to the top of the Democratic presidential primary field by proposing a massive expansion of government. Single-payer health care, free public college tuition, student loan forgiveness, universal pre-K, and more. His plans could cost as much as $60 trillion over the next decade, more than doubling the federal budget. But more than any single policy, Sanders has run on an idea, democratic socialism with Scandinavian countries as models. At times in his life, however, he's also had kind words for socialist revolutionaries and regimes that are far more authoritarian, even though he has condemned their harshest practices. Here to talk with me today about Sanders' vision of democratic socialism and what it could mean for this country is Jim Pethokoukas, He's the DeWitt Wallace Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he writes and edits the AE Ideas blog. Jim, thanks for joining us. Ah, thanks for having me on. Bernie Sanders says he's not just a socialist, he's a democratic socialist. He wants the United States to be more like Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. Is that a bad thing? And how much does his policy agenda actually match up with what the Nordic model uh, is, is doing. Uh, would a Sanders presidency really bring the Nordic model to the United States? Well, I think when, when most people think about socialism, if there's anything that pops into their mind, I, at least I think people of a certain age, um, it's maybe not Denmark or Sweden. They think socialism, they think you know, that the Soviet Union or Cuba, maybe more recently Venezuela. And that is certainly not what Bernie Sanders uh, wants people to think about. He does not want people to think that that is sort of what he's going to deliver to the American people if he's president, that we will become the next Cuba, uh, despite their fine you know, literacy programs. He wants people to associate socialism with something nice that people like. Uh, and that would be Scandinavia, which people go to Scandinavia. It's a lovely place. I've liked, uh, I've enjoyed my visit to Scandinavia. They score very well. Every index where you would want your country to score well on, they pretty much score well on. You know, happiness, human development. Uh, so he wants to think that's what that's the kind of socialism. Those are social democracy, democracies. He wants to think that's what I'm going to bring to you. Sort of no more, no less. You know, they have universal health care and paid leave. That's all. That's all I want to do, and it seems to work out perfectly fine for them. It will work out perfectly fine for us. Uh, you know, their economies have not collapsed. Our economy will not collapse. So, you know, why is this controversial? Uh, but there's a, lot, there are a lot of things about those countries which are nothing like the Bernie Sanders agenda. Uh, those countries all have very low corporate tax rates, just to, just to point out one thing. Uh, in, his, in his economic plan, Bernie Sanders would take the corporate tax rate back up to where it was uh, before the Trump tax cuts. Uh, he, would, uh, he wants to tax capital very heavily. They don't do that in Scandinavia. Uh, they have very uh, they have very low budget deficits. Bernie Sanders isn't a big fan of free trade. Uh, they love free trade. So he is really focusing on a Scandinavia that doesn't exist. In some ways, he's focusing on a Scandinavia from the 1970s. Right. And uh, if you look at the the Nordic model in the 1970s, it had much higher taxes, much higher budget deficits. And they have moved away from those policies in to uh, in a more market driven direction. Um, Talk about that just, just a little bit. Uh, is that what Sanders wants to do here? Is that, uh, is that what his agenda is? And why have those countries moved away from uh, a more uh, a stringent socialist model? Yeah, there were a lot of problems uh, with that with that model, particularly uh, in Sweden. They had a banking crisis. Uh, they were running you know, you know, very high budget deficits. Uh, they had a very generous uh, a welfare program, and people just weren't working. Uh, they had very low productivity. Something had to change. So that model which is really what he's thinking about. I think of it this way, that Bernie Sanders wants, wants the 1970s model, but with sort of the, the 21st century results. But the, those are two very different things. And it's really a bit of sort of sleight of hand to say, uh, it, hey, it's worked in Scandinavia, it can work here. That didn't work in Scandinavia. And particularly the idea that it, does, it really doesn't matter how big your welfare state is, people will keep on you know, working hard. Uh, that, that's certainly not the, the Scandinavian experience. And Scandinavians, they don't like, they don't call themselves, they believe in capitalism. Uh, Elizabeth Warren sort of semi-famously said, I'm a capitalist to, to my bones. I think people in Scandinavia would certainly say that, that, we, that we are capitalists. They have billionaires. Bernie Sanders would like to get rid of all billionaires. Uh, he, you know, he thinks you know, they're a public policy failure. They have a lot of billionaires in Scandinavia. Actually, they have more billionaires per capita 
than we do in the United States. And, you know, billionaires aren't frowned upon. Uh, Bernie Sanders seems to have a visceral distaste for wealthy people. That's certainly not the case in Scandinavia. Uh, you mentioned the welfare state. Sanders uh, has proposed a whopping $60 trillion worth of new government spending uh, as part of his campaign. That's everything from Medicare for all to free college to paid child care and everything in between. Is his agenda remotely feasible politically or economically? I'm not sure how seriously we're supposed to take it. Uh, you know, when I when I when I when I write about it, all the Sanders people, at least among you know journalists who are somewhat favorably inclined, they'll say, you know, you're you're taking him, you know, literally, and you're only supposed to take him seriously, kind of like when Donald Trump, when his agenda, he had this when 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 Trump first started running for president, he had a big tax cut because he was running as a Republican and he had to have a big tax cut. Well, he didn't have a big tax cut. He had to sort of the mother of all tax cuts. It would have been a thirteen trillion dollar tax cut. Now, when he eventually got into office and passed a tax cut, it was a one point five trillion dollar tax cut. So I think what we're supposed to think about that agenda, which would which would du- which would double government spending. I mean that that is absolutely double what we're supposed to spend over the t- ten years. So he would raise that by a hundred percent. The kinds of tax increases. Uh, which wouldn't cover all that spending, but still would be mass. He would massively raise taxes 50 percent, 75 percent, and still wouldn't cover all the spending that he'd want to do. Uh, maybe there are some sort of real Bernie diehards who think that's exactly what he wants to do. And maybe even he in his heart would exactly like to do that. Uh, I don't think anything like that could possibly happen. The example I like to give, let's say he got in office and let's say even he had a bunch of Democrats in Congress, House and Senate. I think that if they actually started to pass an agenda that raised the top tax rate to over 50 percent, a wealth tax, other kinds of payroll taxes, uh, I think a financial transaction tax, pretty much if you've heard of a kind of tax, uh, it's in the Sanders agenda. I I I think the markets would collapse. Uh, It reminds me of back in 2008 when the bank bailout was uh, voted down by the House. Markets collapsed. They voted for the bank bailout. I just find it very difficult to think, even if they could get these votes, anything like that, uh, that's a sort of immediate like, sort of feedback from the financial markets uh, wouldn't be a big stop sign. So billionaires aren't going to pay for all of it? No, and they don't pay for all of it in Scandinavia. That's the thing. That, that, that's really the other half of sort of, the, sort of the, the, the trick that's being, I think, being played on voters. He wants us to spend like Scandinavia, but he doesn't want to tax people like they would do in Scandinavia. In Scandinavia, they have a value added tax. Everybody pays. It isn't just the billionaires. They don't have a big wealth tax in Scandinavia. Uh, they don't. They don't have. They don't have any of those kind of targeted taxes on the wealthy. Sc- Scandinavia is very efficient that way. That the most efficient tax. If you want, listen, if you're going to tax people, you have to. You should be taxing them broadly and in a very efficient way. And that's usually a value added tax. You know, kind of a sales tax on everybody. He, they are not. They are not focusing on the rich, very high marginal tax rates. They are not focusing on very high corporate tax rates. They are not focusing on very high investment tax rates. Nor is there a really a, a untried anywhere kind of wealth tax that Democrats have sort of glommed onto, uh, both Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, which wouldn't just take you know a, you know a little bit of the wealth every year. That year after year, it would basically eviscerate the fortunes. Uh, of all these sorts of billionaires, many of whom actually most advanced economies, most really rich people uh, are business people. They didn't get there because they're, you know, oligarchs and there was a privatization and, and they, you know, and they knew and they knew the, the prime minister. So they got a bunch. They got, you know, a bit of the uh, the gas conglomerate. Uh, the, what, the way people get rich is they create things of value to people and they get very rich. That, that's not punished in Scandinavia. Bernie Sanders thinks that should be punished. All extreme wealth is bad and needs to be uh, gotten rid of. So if Bernie Sanders were president and he got his way, his agenda wouldn't just be funded by billionaires or even by very rich people. It would be funded by the middle class. It would kind of have to be right. If they were actually going to try to do it, that and not crash, they even get anything close to that and not crash the economy. What's very interesting of all of Bernie Sanders and all these projections, what it assumes is that it almost doesn't matter how much you tax people, uh, you know, not, you know, everybody, not just sort of billionaires. It doesn't matter that everything else is the same, that you can tax people at a level and in a way that has never been tried before. But he's very confident that we'll still be able to grow as fast as we've grown in the past, if not faster. I mean, that is he is basically asking voters to hold hands and we're all going to take a step together into the darkness. 
Now he th- he, th- he thinks that he thinks that di- on the other side of that darkness is utopia, but that that's just a wild conjecture on on his part. There there's no model that says that would be the case. So it it really is an amazing gamble, both on that amount of spending and that amount of taxation. All right. So speaking of darkness, uh, let's talk a little bit about Bernie Sanders' remarks with uh, regards to to Cuba. He has gotten himself in a little bit of trouble uh, for saying uh, that he admired uh, Cuba's literacy program, that that literacy rates actually went up, uh, even while he says all you know that he condemns uh, the, uh, Cuba's authoritarianism. He's also said uh, in the past that nice things about the Sandinistas, the left wing revolutionaries in the, in Nicaragua. What do you make of Sanders' apparent fondness for socialist authoritarians? What does that tell us about his political worldview? I think his worldview is that he has very similar goals, which he believes in a certain radical egalitarianism. And so he feels a fondness for people who also had that goal. Now, listen, he'll, to be fair, he'll say, you know, I'm for democracy. I'm not for, I'm not for people being lined up. I'm not for, you know, dissidents being jailed. So he will say that uh, about Cuba, same thing about the Soviet Union, but nowhere has he conceded anything that the way those countries run their economies just doesn't work. That you know, what, what, is he, what has he learned from the failure of the Soviet economy? What has he learned from the failure of the Cuban economy? Or the fact that China was really, really poor until they adopted a little bit of capitalism? I don't know that he's ever really commented on that. I mean, there's been no... Elizabeth Warren, her campaign is a, sort of a critique of capitalism. Uh, but Bernie Sanders has never offered any critique of sort of socialist economics, which really makes me wonder. Uh, he gave a speech uh, at Georgetown a few at Georgetown, maybe it was George Washington a few years ago, and he was talking about you know what he believed, and he and he and he, and he just the you know the sort of relief people said, I'm not for seizing the means of production. I'm not going to go nationalize. That's everything. a relief. Yeah, that's the thank you. You know, he's like then, but then he said, I'm you know you can you know I'm not going to you know I'm not going to nationalize the corner grocery store. Well, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot else besides a corner grocery store. And I think if sort of he had his druthers, because that's really part of socialism, that either you would have the government seize the means of production where, gov- where government would run everything and or which a lot of democratic socialists talk about, that's not the government owning things, they would at least control things, or perhaps they would strip companies from the capitalist owners and give them to the workers. And all companies would be run by worker councils. Again, not a lot of evidence that would work. So you say Sanders' campaign is in many ways a critique of capitalism um, coming from a socialist perspective. One of the things that has struck me about his campaign, uh, particularly right now, is that it's kind of making the argument that the economy is actually awful. He says, sure, it's great if you are rich, if you're a billionaire, if you're one of the 1%, but for everybody else, uh, they're all stuck in a bad system. The game is rigged. But that's kind of at odds with the economic data. Um, talk a little bit about this. Why is Bernie Sanders so stuck on the on this idea that the economy is terrible when, in fact, it's we've had a boom that has lasted more than a decade and economic confidence is actually pretty hot? I'm not sure there was any point in the last 50 years where if you would ask Bernie Sanders about the American economy, he would have said, this is a terrible economy. It's only working for people at the top everybody else has been left behind. So it has been it has been a it has been a chronic sort of refrain by him through, you know, the long boom from the uh, early 80s through 2007 through the 1990s. Listen, if you don't think the 1990s was a good economic period for the United States, then apparently that's just not possible. So he'll say things like uh, you know, living standards and wages are, you know, have, have gone nowhere since the 1960s or the 1970s. Uh, listen, you don't have to dig down to the economic data to know that just doesn't smell right. I think very few people who were alive in 1960 and 70 would like to go back and live in those homes, uh, you know, with with those with those very dangerous automobiles. If you really do dig down to the wage the wage data, uh, what you find out is that there was there's sort of very slow growth to a decline in wage data. The 70s, 70s were a terrible were a terrible decade through the 80s. But since probably 1990, real wages are probably up 30, 35 percent. Incomes are up. None of that is ever acknowledged by leftists, 
Democrats, and now actually some Republicans. So the economy is not nearly as bad as Sanders uh, thinks it is. Lowest unemployment rate in 50 years, not terrible. That's, you know, that's, that's not very bad. We're in the 11th year of recession. For, I mean, it's, listen, this isn't 1999, the, the internet boom, but it's also not 2009 when the economy was collapsing, but we are in sort of a long forever collapse, according to the left. And so it's not as bad as he thinks it is, but if he gets his way, it just might be. There's no reason to think that he has figured out or that the uh, democratic socialists or socialists have figured out a different way to make an economy prosper. Listen, um, we know we were talking about Cuba a little earlier and say, well, you know, but Cuba's done some some good things. You know, they have they've had literacy programs, uh, you know, a pretty long life expectancy. Well, they say the same thing about the Soviet Union. That the Soviet Union, listen, it was a you know it was a very poor country, and then they industrialized. So actually, some things were you know pretty good about USSR. But you know, a lot of countries went through that process where they were sort of poor agrarian societies, and then they urbanized and they got a lot richer. Other other countries, you know, that's happened with Japan, it's happened with Korea, it's happened in all countries. But they've been able to do that without gulags and without uh, mass killing and without repression of any rights. You can have all that good stuff and also have a democracy. That seems like the right way to do it. Jim, thank you so much for speaking with me. All today. right, thank you. Yeah.